I think that was a fast keep. You have a carry add into a siege rhino with a, it off. with a commune? Yeah. Like that that's a that's a winning hand. Easy keep. You can't even make a smiley face out of those. Yeah. Because you only have four. That's actually that's tough. We got a monastery Swiss beer here for Peter. We are underway here in our finals from Providence. Oliver does have a couple of lands, actually. He's going to start with the temple, take a look at that top card. That's going to go to the bottom. We're going to head back Winsway. He'll draw a card. And it couldn't be a budget issue, because I actually think Monastery Swift Spear is about as expensive as Sergo. <laughs> I'll let you talk to him after the tournament. Give him a stern talking to. Here's a Lightning Berserker. It's going to be dashed. We're in for a couple points of damage here. Pass that turn back. Oliver will draw a card for the turn. It's Sylvan Carry added. He'll kick it back over to Wynn. Wynn will draw. It's a mountain. I think it's a Hordling Outburst. It is. Trigger Prowess. Trigger finds your Zenith in three times. Beat downs. Block there. Four damage going to come across. Red can be relentless. But listen, if Oliver has Siege Runner next turn, it's still a game. Yes. That's, that's how good the best cards in this deck are in the matchup. How's Thoughtseize? In this spot, not that great. No. Got to cast it, which is what he's going to do. Two Lightning Strikes and yeah. Lightning Berserker staring right back at him. Yeah. Thoughtseize you. All right. I'll reveal the bottom of the trash can. <laughs> <laughs> the commons I found at the end of my store's local draft. <laughs> Good enough to make it to the finals, that's for sure. I think Thoughtseize is actually underrated against Mono Red because there are some draws where they have one thing that can answer your one thing and that can be good but the spots like this it's really bad it's high variance against Mono Red but sometimes it's you know a fine option yeah usually bad but occasionally is okay when with two lightning strikes he'll draw a card his lightning observer got selected by Thoughtseize to might go down to 11 a lot of people are adopting the Gerard Peelback. He he has really influenced the Magic it's community in several ways. Really awesome, actually. Yeah. Giving yourself a sweat for the draw step. Lightning Berserker was the draw. Going to dash that in. Here's a block on Foundry Denizen. Some pumps. So three, four, five, six, seven. Puts you to four. And it's got to be Siege Runner right now. And, I'm, and Siege Runner might be fine here. I think that's his best draw by a lot. Yep. Running Siege Rhinos or Siege Rhino involve something involving Whip of Erebos. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah, carry at it, not going to do it. Peter Wing going to win game number one here over Oliver Tomiko very, very quickly. Model Red Aggro, we're quickly up a game here over Rob's on Reanimator, which means we can turn our attention to the sideboard. Oliver with four copies of Fleece Main Lion, two copies of Arbor Colossus, a Farika God of Affliction, two Bioblights, two Ultimate Prices, a Glare of Heresy, a Thoughtseize, a Master of the Unseen, and another end. Most notably here, no Drown in Sorrows. None. That's notable. And that's usually the first card that these kind of decks go to to shore up the mono red matchup. The cards that I believe will be coming in here, the two copies of Bio Blight and the four copies of Police Main Lion, I believe are no-brainers. Things to shore up the early game. Two copies of Arbor Colossus may come in because it's just a very big card. It's a big threat, but it is very slow, and there's already a lot of other four- and five-mana cards in the deck that can sort of parallel that sort of effect. Peter's side. Two Rebel Masters, three Searing Blood, four Arc Lightning, two Magmatic Chasm, four copies of Roasty Toasty. Four copies of Roast, two Goblins, Goblin, Rebel Master. That's what I like in the matchup. Rebel Master, I think, may not come in in the dark because you'd be worried about something like Drown and Sorrow. With no Drown and Sorrow in the list, I, I think he's got to bring him in. And the four Roasts kills Siege Rhino, Corsair Crucifix, and other similar cards. The it best is, cards in the matchup. It is so nice when you have access to the opponent's deck list and just, you know that, okay, I don't have to worry about Drown and Sorrow at all. I'm just no gonna play. Sweeper. Yeah, all my stuff. Play it all. Who cares? Yeah, Doomwake Giant's the one consideration, but that almost doesn't matter because when Doomwake comes down, then it's a 4-6 in play, so the leftovers in your hands still aren't very good. Yeah. It also happens turn after turn. So that barely, that is rarely a factor in terms of how you deploy your threats. No Drown in Sorrow is great news for Peter, and knowing about it up front, even better. We'll very quickly talk about what these players are playing for here. What everyone who joined the Open Series this week and all 498 players played for first place, Pretty cool. $5,000, 25 Open Series points, and an invite to our Season 2 Invitational. A lot of the players we were following this weekend on our Season 2 leaderboard were really on the hunt for those 20 and 25 points. Danny Chesup most notably falling a bit short. For these two players, a lot of money at stake and an invite to the Invitational. 
course. Second place, two thousand dollars, twenty open series points, and an invite to our invitational. Ross Merriam, a player who finished in twenty ninth place this weekend, he walked away with two hundred dollars and six open series points. And every point for Ross and Danny, as you mentioned, rather important. Yeah, a top eight performance for either of those players this weekend would have been a huge deal, allowing them to jump Kevin Jones in the standings. As it stands, we'll have to wait for the updates from the modern IQ, but I believe when it's all said and done, Kevin Jones will still be holding on to his lead as things currently stand. And we will find out if he'll be in Cleveland next weekend because we know that Gerard Fabiano will be. We know that Andrew Boswell will be. I wouldn't be surprised if Ross Merriam is. He was at Grand Prix Cleveland about a month ago where he made the top eight, so not too far for him to go, and there's a lot on the line. The race is pretty tight. And I've gotten not a full confirmation from the person himself, but some rumors coming through the pipeline Don't that Joe Lissette will be in Cleveland yes. as well. Yes. Yes. Papa Joe. Show them what Cleveland's all about, baby. Believe land. That's right. California has nice water. We have nice water. We're going to be right on the waterfront mm -hmm. of the Cleveland Convention Center. I'll show you. We're right across from Brown Stadium. I gave you the full tour, my man. It probably, probably compares with the Santa Monica Pier. We'll have to check it out. Basically the same thing. <laughs> I'm going to give you the full tour, take you to the Horseshoe. Okay. Cleveland's Casino. Sweet. That's probably not depressing at all. No, no, no. <laughs> it's really nice. It's really nice. Yeah, I'm sure a Rust Belt casino is just <laughs> totally, totally uplifting to the human spirit. It was an, yeah, it, check it out. It was an abandoned warehouse that they turned into a casino. Yeah. Okay. Because Cleveland is thriving now. Right. It is thriving. Yeah, the casino is usually a sign of urban revival. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'll give you a good tour. I'll give you a good tour of that. <laughs> Got some great restaurants. You okay. shut your mouth. It's beautiful there, as you will find out next weekend. And hopefully most of you will, too, who are watching. Listen, I'm willing to give Cleveland a fair shake. I've not been there in a very long time, the Grand Prix, many moons ago. So it's, it's been a while. But when you're trying to upsell me on the place, and the first things you're talking about are a condemned lake, a casino, and... I would, I assume, is probably a real reasonably sketchy part of town. It's right downtown. <laughs> right from, it's literally right there for everyone to see. It's not doing a lot to sell me on it. It's really nice. It's a really nice place. And you will enjoy yourself thoroughly. And you'll be hoping, you know what's going to happen after that tournament? So we're going to be hoping we go back that's probably, every year. That's probably true. That's what's going to happen. Oliver will be on the play here for game number two. He's going to keep his opening in, as will Peter. No mono red player stares at their opening hand for that long and then mulligans. That's never happened. No. Well, he has no one drop, which is very hard to do. Here's a mountain. Let's see what else he's got, though. Dragon Fodder's not a bad start. Here come two goblins. Oliver with a courser. That's hard to get through. Top card, windswept teeth, trigger, gain a life, 21. Fleece main lion on top of the deck. Very good start for Oliver. I think the rest of his hands maybe lands, but even still, this is a pretty good start. Yeah. Peter not fast out of the gates. Corsair may just block the whole thing. The question is, does he have a roast or not? Roast is a big deal right now. Stoke the Flames works as well. Wild Slash. Searing Blood. Ooh, combo. All right. All right. Hey, that's good enough to get it off the table. Beatdowns. Down to 16. And just a couple lands there, another lightning strike, and a wild slash. Yep. Not a great hand here for Peter. No. But oddly enough, not a great hand here for Oliver either. He, all he has is a fleece line. He's going to play a temple, take a look at the top card. He will think it over before leaving it on top. There's fleece main. Pass it over. Win on tap. Take a draw step. See what he can do on his fourth turn of the game. Picked up a mountain. Flooding a little bit. Yes. Kept a relatively land-heavy, relatively removal-heavy draw, and so far appears to just found more of the same. Michael will take one. Mountain pass. What did Oliver keep on top? He thought about it for a bit and decided Dead Protector was good enough. Dead Protector definitely is good enough. I mean, this is a, a game that's shaping up to be very slow. There's two juicy targets in the graveyard already. Uh, actually, Fleece Main Lion might be better than the two because Oliver's in a position very soon to be able to get it back and go monstrous in the same shot. And there's a morph. 
Pass the turn back. Wild slash at the ready. See Peter taking a look at the graveyard. Yep, got a wild slash it. Force him on a morph it. Oliver says, I'll sacrifice my fetch land. Forester planes. Looks like it's going to be planes as he's ignoring the forest on the bottom of his deck. So there's the planes. From Portal, probably older than him. Definitely older than him. Same with his Mirage Forest. I started doing the math and then uh, a couple rounds ago and then realized it wasn't even actually close. Yeah, I don't remember when Portal was released. There's a couple different versions of it, but a lot of them were in the 90s and early 2000s. So. Jeez. And those Mirage Lands, forget about it. 97, 98. Police man lion, come on back. There goes Den Protector. Time to untap. Wind needs a creature. Rabble like, Master would help a lot here. Like right now. Oh, sweating it out. Gerard, look what you've done. Did you call it? Oh, heel cutter. There's a block. Take four. I like dashing or casting? I like dashing. It's more damage that turn, and mana is not going to be a bottleneck for Peter this game. Peter going to play a land. I was hoping he would do that because he might get to the point where he just dashes two of them in the same turn. Hello, Siege Rhino. I still think Oliver this turn is better served just going fleece main and try to go monstrous. I guess the risk is that the last card is Lightning Slash. Oh, Lightning Strike, excuse me. He's definitely going to give this some thought. All right, he's going to go with Siege Rhino. You could also just have a Rhino Fleece main turn. Which is still pretty good, right? Well, Just do this, there the, you go. The problem with this play is that if, if Peter has a way to remove the Fleece Main line and he gets a draw step to it this turn, then he gets to kill that, and he, you already know he has a heal cutter to clock your Siege Rhino. So your defenses aren't really that stable. Heal cutter. So, uh, you know, the, the risk with the other play... Uh, no matter what path Oliver chooses, Lightning Strike's really bad for him. Because this turn, he, he gets to, you know, cold the Siege Rhino and kill the Fleece Main Lion. And my play, which is play the Fleece Main Lion and go monstrous, he Lightning Strike's in response, and that's really bad for you. The difference is, if Peter doesn't have Lightning Strike, in this scenario, we play on. And in, in my scenario, the game's just over. I mean, sure. there's a 4-4 Hexproof Fleece Main Lion, Peter's got nothing going on, and you have a Siege Rhino left over in your hand. One so teeth was a land. Here's five mana. There's the activation. And now the road is blocked. And okay, never mind. Rhino is feeling frisky. Looking to close the game out now. Ultimate price was the draw for Oliver this turn, too. I think you might be headed to a third one now. Yeah, I, and, and Peter's hands just lands. Yep. And Fleece main line on this spot is basically saying, all right, now you have to just burn me out. Oliver's a 12. That's a heel cutter. There's a land pass turn back. Oliver going to sacrifice his fetch land. Because I think somebody's got some interest in getting this game over with. We'll probably see alternate price on the unstep targeting the heel cutter. Yep. Oliver's life total is so high, he can afford to take the point of damage there, get a land out of his deck. We'll see what his draw step here is in a moment. Didn't get a great look at it. Draw step, truthfully, might not even matter. No, uh, P Oliver's got the win on the table. Courser, trigger, gain a life. Hero's downfall on top. I think we'll see him send both in now. Oh, yeah. Peter, no blocks. It's blocking that can help him win. And drawing card isn't going to help him win either. He's at five. And that is going to do it. Oliver Tomiko is going to win game number two here over Peter Wynn. I was on Reanimator. On our aggro. Going again number three, but this is why it's important to know that Peter Wynn is the number two overall seed, which means he gets to play first. Yeah, that's that's really important. And, and what's also really important for Peter here in terms of playing is that in a lot of these matchups, when your opponent has access to Dread and Sorrow, you kind of have to go through some hoops, and a lot of the a lot of that involves setting out some of your cheap creatures. 
Peter can stay spell dense and threat dense here, low to the, as low to the ground as he wants to, because he doesn't worry about drowning sorrow. So instead of being able having to take out some of his one drops to protect himself against drowning, he gets to leave them all in, and that means being on the play even better. For Peter, we saw him keep kind of a sketcher. Yeah. Game two. I think some modern players are a little bit afraid to mulligan aggressively. I think if you're on the play here, you have to have one drop. Well, I, I, it's different because it's different on the draw because you can't overvalue your one drops when you're on the draw because it's too likely Oliver just goes carry added coarser. Your one drops don't matter. So I think it's fine to keep some slower hands when you're on the draw because it's so likely that your one drops don't really matter anyway, and it's really rough to mulligan against a deck that's packing a lot of removal spells. Peter's hand was not very good in game two. I don't know exactly what the opening seven was, but it didn't feel like a mulligan. He did draw a lot of lands and, and more removal spells. On the play, I think it's more important to go for your one drops because you're going to have a couple uncontested turns. Okay. Well, he's shuffling up here for game number three, as is Oliver. It looks like they're both happy enough with their configurations. We'll see. I still think that Mono Red is favored here, especially on the play for game three, but I mean, it's not a guarantee. Exactly. Uh, you know, I would rather be on Peter's side of things. We know how good the good cards are in Oliver's deck in the matchup, though. He's got a handful of cards that force Peter to have an overwhelming board or roast slash token flames. And... Because of that, Oliver can come back from dire straits. Peter can go one drop, two drop, three drop, and if he doesn't have a removal spell to back it up, Corsair or Siege Rhino can be a brick wall. How do you feel when you're a mono red player playing against a deck like this, where some of their cards are really good, some you know some of them are just okay? You've got you're a huge favorite game one, so you're basically given the game when he did win game one. Now it's like, all right, game three, this is where I want to be on the play. Uh I don't mind. I mean, of course, you're always stressed out about their best cards because they're so good against you. But in matchups like the one that Peter has, where he's a big favorite game one, and then games two and three get a little bit more rough, and the whole time there's these high-impact cards that could beat you, I sort of feel like, yeah, he's got to get lucky twice to beat me. That okay. can happen, you know? Uh, but without Drown and Sorrow especially, I mean, that's not the easiest thing to do. He's gone. Doesn't even want to play it out. Nope. Game three is just its too much for him to take. Don't blame him. You know, you don't. Yeah. Well, we're coming back to us really quickly here. Oliver is going to get ready for his last game of the tournament. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like to me. So we might be heading to a break here for just a moment. But thus far, it's been a lot of fun to watch. I know a lot of people at home rooting for Andrew Boswell to maybe get that open series win finally. And this game a little bit short. I don't think the matchup was very good that he ran into. Same. And, uh, you know, so it goes. Yeah. You know, he, he played well. The games were very, very close. Game three in particular was one worth going back and looking at again because there's so many lines of play from Andrew's side of the table, so many things to factor in. Um, but that's how it goes. You know, you can, that's the nature of having top eights that are single elimination. You can have a great Swiss tournament, Boswell with two buys, but still win, you know, 11 and two or something like that. Yeah, so you, he lost two matches record. this weekend. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to win your three single elimination matches in a row. What you did in the Swiss rounds don't, doesn't really matter. It's helpful to have the first overall seat, but that's no guarantee of anything. Yep. And your day could be over just like that. Yeah, and it was. And I do think the matchup was pretty tough. And if Obson Agro starts to pick up, you know, the deck that Oliver is playing or the deck that Dustin Taylor is playing, Salter Animator, pretty natural place to go to. It's part of the reason that if you look right after, right at the moment after, uh, Ari Lax won Pro Tour Cons of Tarkiri. You didn't see a lot of Obzon Aggro because Obzon Midrange was the deck. And that matchup for Obzon Aggro has just always been an uphill battle. They yeah. just have a slightly bigger, slightly slower, slightly more powerful build. And if you look at the history of Magic's Creature Mirror matches, that's where you want to be. You want to be the one with the slightly bigger threat, the one with slightly more removal, the one that has a, a better top end, the one that has more protection against flooding out because you have things to do with your mana that are really powerful. And uh, that is the Obzon mid-range or Obzon control versus Obzon aggro matchup in a nutshell. It's a little bit different here because you have Whoop of Erebos and that brings certain pluses and minuses to the table, but it's still the same story. Uh, you know, unless you get a jump on them, or there's some games where, where Rakshasa Death Dealer is weirdly problematic because they can't kill it. In fact, in the match that in, that Boswell lost, the game he won was mostly because of Rakshasa Death Dealer being an awkward card to answer. Uh, if you're 
running your stuff into their stuff, their stuff's going to be better more often than not. Yeah, for sure. That's just how, it, how it breaks sometimes. So we have one more game left for you guys. We're going to take a short break here from Providence. Oliver using the restroom really quickly. So once he does come back, we will join game number three. So stick and stay here for just a minute. We'll see you guys back here from Providence in just a bit. Star City Games is proud to offer cardboard crack books online and at all of our events. The popular webcomic is now available in five books, including the newest, I'm Always Thinking About Cardboard Crack, all featuring comics not published online. Each volume of more than 100 comics is just $12.99. Visit StarCityGames.com and get your copies of Cardboard Crack today. Join us on the road to the StarCityGames.com Players Championship in Cleveland, Ohio on April 25th. With a $20,000 standard open and two $5,000 Premier Invitational qualifiers featuring Legacy and Modern, the Open Series is paying out more than ever before. 16 players will qualify for any of the next four StarCityGames.com Invitationals, where they'll battle for $50,000 in cash prizes and a coveted seat in our year-end Players' Championship. Join us to compete, trade, play side events, or just hang out with friends at the StarCityGames.com Open Series in Cleveland. The StarCityGames.com Spring Sale is here. Hundreds of items are already on sale, and we're adding more every weekday throughout the month of April. From standard singles, to booster boxes, to wacky unglued cards, there's something for everyone. Check back every weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern to see what you can save on next at StarCityGames.com slash Spring Sale. back everybody for game number three Star City Games Open Series here in Providence our last game of our entire tournament Model Red versus Obson Reanimator Foundry Denizen gonna get dirty Peter with a one lander oh boy and now sweating it out Ooh. he's got a swift spear a trigger an attack in for three let's see what Oliver's turn two play is He's got lands that enter the battlefield untapped. One swept teeth down to 16. There's a forest. And these might be one of those kind of hands from Peter where if Drown and Sorrow was in all of his deck, he would just have to send it back. Yeah. Because the fail rate's too high on two axes. But without Drown and Sorrow, he can kind of keep hands like this. Seder Wayfinder. Let's take a look at the top four. Temple, Doomwake, Siege Rhino, Ultimate Price. Oliver gets a Temple, rest go to the bin. We're heading back Peter's way. Can he draw land number two? All right, yes he can. <laughs> <laughs> I like a little bit of flourish. Yeah, me too. This is a one-lander with a lot of threes. Yeah, that's, so he's, that's, that's, he's, that's, not, he's not out of the woods just yet. He'll be peeling his next card like that. <laughs> that's, <laughs> which is a little weird, but all right. I mean, this is, it's a little ugly right now because he kind of has to potentially just trade with a Wayfinder, which is not what he wants to do. But otherwise, it's moat. And I think you just got to deploy your, your ones here and let him trade. It's not great. I think you just hard cast the Berserker. I don't think you dash it. No, I don't mind dashing here because yeah. if uh, Oliver's so likely to block the 
Foundry Shoot Den is in, okay. which you're actually happy with because he has Bile Blights in his sideboard. Okay, all right. And this is also kind of a hedge against not drawing land number three. Sure, sure. So you have something to do next turn. Well, if you have something to do next turn with the fact that you can play... Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Like, you can just pump into your Berserker. You, like, you can't do that now. That's the part that I would like, because he could just go Berserker attack. That's not land number three. That's Swiss Spear number two. Well, he can just deploy his two creatures now and attack with the Powder Sheet Tennis. And that's fine. Yeah, it's not so bad. I'm good with that. But now I would not dash. You can get filthy, yeah. Oh, or, oh all or, right. Or you can get filthy. I would be nervous about making this kind of attack because if Murderous Cuts in Oliver's hand, just ring the bell. Well, it's, <laughs> so, well, well, it's in his hand, so I don't have a bell in front of me, but you can assume that I'm ringing it. Ugh, it's a tough turn. <laughs> You can attack with just the Foundry Street Denizen there, and if he trades with the Fleece Main Line, that's fine. If he has a Murderous Cut, he probably just cuts your Denizen. Oliver will draw. That's the old worst-case scenario. <laughs> yes, yes it is. Den Protector will be deployed as Morph. This is really Peter's last turn to do something good before the game gets out of control. If he has a land and a Hordling Outburst, he still might be able to chip in for a few points of damage here and there. He but he's draw, running out of time. He needs to draw a land this turn. He did. Okay. He gets to play magic now. Now, for what it's worth, if Oliver has a land that enters the battlefield untapped in his hand, and he does, this may not matter. A little Doomwave giant yes. action. Yes. Boom, boom. Draw a card. Forest. Pain free. Kill all your stuff. Like that turn from Oliver, killing all Peter's stuff. Yeah, your proof. Your proof of that one. You can play, get a 4 6 into play also. Yep. Here's an attack for two. And Oliver playing super conservative because he has a Whip of Erebus in his hand. So yep. next turn he gets to uh, win the game, essentially. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Searing Blood the draw. You can cast that and take care of the morph if you'd like. A 4-6 is the biggest thing in the world against a red deck. Yeah, now with, with Roast in these deck sideboards, it's actually critical to have some creatures of this size. Yeah. Before, Siege Rhino was also basically unkillable. Now there's a distinction. There's the Searing Blood. Bye-bye, Den Protector. A little damage dealt as well. No good attack to be had from the Swift Spear. The players are going to make sure life totals are correct. But for Peter Wynn, even though he's at 18 right now, he's not going to be there much longer if there's Whip of Erebus over there for Oliver. And I just want to make sure everything is kosher. All this will be for naught if we're talking about Oliver's life total here. Yes. As soon as it's about to go to basically unlimited. I think it's done going down. I think it's only going up now as you will untap. And no, I think Peter's going to get to crack back with the Swift Spear next turn for one, maybe oh. two if he casts the portaling outburst. Par pardon me, sir. <laughs> There's a land. Then Protector and Whip of Erebus are the options. It's a whip. A thumbs up, a reluctant one, an attack for seven. Peter knows what this means. Yep. Oliver's up to 16 now. Peter's down to 11. Follow-up is a dead protector. Peter may go. But Oliver has a siege rhino in his graveyard to return. Here's a whirling outburst, trigger. And he will concede the game and the match. Oliver to Mike go is your standard open champion here in Providence, the youngest open series champion of all time, 14 I mean, years that, old. That's, that's not actually confirmed, but I can't imagine we've had one younger. I can confirm yeah. that. At 14 years of age, he is your youngest Star City Games open series champion of all time. 